Okay, today we come to chapter 6 in our study of Organic Chemistry 1. Chapter 6 is going to cover a whole host of topics. We're going to be looking at alkyl halides and nucleophilic substitution and elimination reactions. If you recall in the uh, syllabus, uh, we have our exam going up through uh, substitution reactions. Elimination reactions will begin a next section, which will be for another exam. But nonetheless, we will cover everything uh, in this PowerPoint presentation. So there are classes of alkyl halides. Remember an alkyl halide is whenever I have a halogen on an organic molecule. So here is an alkyl halide on where I have a bromine on this alkyl, this ethyl group. I can also have a vinyl halide where I have a halogen on this vinyl group. A vinyl group is a carbon-carbon double bond. Or I can have a halide, such as an iodide, on an aryl ring, or often ca sometimes called a benzene ring, and so you get what are called the aryl halides. We're going to be spending most of our time in this chapter on alkyl halides. Here we're going to review polarity. Uh, recall we did this back in chapters 1 and 2. Here we have a polar bond. Remember that set up is where we have an electronegative atom attached to a less electronegative atom. And so we get a dipole moment pointing in the direction of the more electronegative atom. And as a result we get a partial negative charge on it and a partial positive charge on the less electronegative atom. The reason being again is that the more electronegative atom is pulling both of these bonding electrons closer to it. And that's what's being depicted in this electron potential diagram. You see all this red here, meaning it's pulling a lot of the electron density toward this chlorine. And as a result, carbon can now be easily attacked by a nucleophile. And that's what we're going to be doing in this chapter. And what we'll see is that the halogen will then leave with these bonding electrons. But we'll spell this out in more detail as we go through these slides. So how do we name alkyl halides? Okay. Choose the longest carbon chain. Okay. Even if the halogen is not bonded to any of those carbons. Okay. So this parent chain is always the longest continuous carbon chain in the molecule. We lose, use the lowest numbers for position. So here's an example. You have the chlorine here on the second carbon of four carbons in a row. So we can number them like this here. It's on the two carbon. And so we have a two chlorobutane. Remember the halogens are chloro, fluoro, iodo, bromo, and so forth. Here, a little more complicated one. Let's go ahead and number this parent chain. If you note, we have seven straight across. It would be nice to be able to include these two in the parent chain, but when I do, one, two, three, four, five, six, I come one short of the longest one, which is seven. So this thing here is going to be a substituent, and it will be a complex substituent. So I'll number it one, two. And so the fluoro is on the second carbon, 
of the branch. So we have a 2-fluoroethyl, and this whole thing is on the 4-carbon, so we put a 4 out in front. And then, of course, our parent chain is heptane. Some more examples. Here I can number the parent chain straight across. So the bromo is on 6, the methyl is on 2. Remember, I put them in alphabetical order, so I'll name the bromo first, even though it has a higher number. Remember, the numbers have nothing to do with the ordering of substituents. Down here, we have the bromo here and the fluoro here. So they are 1, 3 related. And they are showing to be cis. So there's the numbering. And I have the cis 1 bromo 3 fluoro cyclohexane. You can also have some uh, common names that are useful for only small alkyl groups such as here. Remember this is the isobutyl group so I can name this isobutyl as a bromide. Okay, So these systematic common names is when I name it as a bromide or a chloride or an iodide and so forth. Okay, This kind of comes from remember this compound here back in general chemistry, that was what? Sodium chloride. Okay, So that's where we're kind of getting this stuff from. Here, the bromine is on the secondary carbon, so we have a sec butyl bromide. Here, the isomer is the t-butyl group, so we'll have a t-butyl bromide or a tert-butyl bromide. Some other common names of halides, remember the methylene group is the CH2, and when we have two um, halogens on it, we get a methylene halide. So an example of that would be, if that was a chlorine, you would get methylene chloride. Here you can have a haliform if you have three halogens on the same carbon. So if that was a chlorine, you would get chloroform, for example. And here, if you have four carbons, or four halogens on the same carbon, it's a carbon tetrahalide. So if this was a chlorine, you would have carbon tetrachloride. Okay, and these things turn out to be nice solvents. Methylene chloride, a very nice solvent so is chloroform, and so is carbon tetrachloride. Methyl halides is where we have the halogen attached to a methyl group. A primary alkyl halide is carbon, which the halogen is bonded to only one other carbon. Okay, so these are simple definitions of types of alkyl halides. Okay, it's the halogen. What type of carbon is the halogen attached to? If it's attached to a primary carbon, secondary carbon, or a tertiary carbon. Those gives you the different types of alkyl halides. Here's some examples. Here would be a methyl halide. Here's a primary halide because this carbon is primary. This carbon is secondary and the halogen's attached to it, so we get a secondary halide. And down here, the carbon is here a tertiary, and the halogen's attached to it, so we get a tertiary halide. Types of dihalides. If I have two halogens attached to the same carbon, I get what's called a geminal dihalide, or in this case, a geminal dibromide. If the two halogens are on neighboring carbons, they are vicinal to each other. 
So this would be a vicinal dichloride. And here are the, the uh, definitions I just stated. Some uses of alkyl halides. They're used in industrial and household cleaners. You also see them in anesthetics, okay, where chloroform uh, used to be a general anesthetic, but it is very toxic and carcinogenic, so needless to say, we don't use that anymore to knock people out. Okay, this mixed halide is sold as halothane, which you may have heard of. Freons, used as refrigerants and foaming agents, okay, these have often been used in uh, refrigerators and so forth, okay, but they harm the ozone layers, so we tend to stay away from them. And also alkyl halides are majorly used as pesticides. Okay, So if you ever look on a can of pesticides you'll see sometimes a lot of alkyl halides in there. Again a review of dipole moments. Okay, The dipole moment always points toward the halogen. So again partial negative here and the partial positive will always be on the carbon. A review of the electronegativity differences. Remember fluorine is the most electronegative and as you go down the group you go to a less electronegative. Bond length increases as the size of the halogen increases. So iodine is the biggest halogen and so it's going to form a longer bond whereas fluorine is a small, the smallest atom, and so it will be a shorter bond. Here you get a glimpse of the dipole moments. Okay. It's interesting that the carbon chlorine and the carbon fluorine turn out to be almost the same. Okay, and again Molecular dipoles depend upon the geometry of the molecule. We studied that back in chapter 2. But here, let's get another glimpse of that with carbon tetrachloride. Okay, we get these dipoles pointing toward each of the chlorines. So even though the molecule has four polar bonds, overall these cancel out, and so it gives a molecular dipole of zero. So it has polar bonds, but the molecule is nonpolar. Some boiling points. Again, the greater the intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point because you're trying to separate the molecules. Dipole dipole attractions, not significantly different for different halides. London forces are greater for larger atoms. The greater the mass, we tend to get a higher boiling point. Spherical shapes decreases the boiling point. So remember how to get a spherical shape is when I get a lot of branching. So this T-butyl bromide is very branched, so it'll be more spherical than this linear bromide. And as a result, you get a lower boiling point. Densities, alkyl chlorides with two or more chlorine atoms are denser than water. All alkyl bromides and iodides are denser than water. So that would mean that they would tend to be on the bottom layer if you mixed it with water. Okay. Alkyl fluorides and chlorides with just one chlorine atom tend to be less dense than water, so these kinds would tend to float on top of water. How do we make alkyl halides? Okay, One way to make them is from free radical halogenation that we saw back in Chapter 4. Okay, The only problem is, is that you end up getting a mixture of products and we don't like to get mixtures. We like to just get one product. Okay, 
Remember in the bromination reaction it was more selective. Okay, But in general free radical halogenations are not a good way to uh, produce alkyl halides again because of getting mixtures. We don't like mixtures. Okay, And we'll talk about allylic groups in organic chemistry part two so let's just hold off of this for right now. So review of free radical halogenations. Okay, Here we do it with cyclohexane since all the carbon atoms are the same. Okay, We get a monochlorinated derivative such as this. Here with the bromine Okay, it's showing the selectivity of the bromide, adding on here. Okay, so just a reminder that chlorination is not selective because the chlorine radical is less stable than the bromine radical, and so it doesn't care where it's attacking. Whereas the bromine radical does care where it attacks, and it would like to go after this hydrogen and produce the more stable radical here on the tertiary which is why we get a high amount of the t-butyl bromide. Okay, again we'll hold off this allylic bromination. Okay, the allylic group that we'll see later is simply the carbon adjacent to a double bond. Okay, again we'll hold off of this here. n bromosacinamide Okay. Here's the structure for n bromosacinamide oftentimes simply called NBS for its acronym. Okay. And we'll learn later that it likes to brominate at the allylic carbon. Okay? But we're not going to hold you accountable for this stuff right now. Okay, and there's an example of that reaction. Let's move on. Reactions of alkyl halides. Okay, it turns out to be two different types of reactions they can undergo. One is a nucleophilic substitution, and the other is an elimination reaction. In the substitution reaction, we have a nucleophile that substitutes for the halogen. And so that's why it's called a substitution reaction. In the elimination reaction, what happens is a base that we use comes and takes a hydrogen next door to the halogen. These electrons dump here and the halogen again leaves. And so we get an elimination reaction because the hydrogen and the halogen have been eliminated and the product we get in an elimination reaction is a carbon-carbon double bond. And what we're going to do is study substitution reactions first and then come back to elimination reactions. So let's proceed. In substitution reactions there are two types, the SN2 and the SN1. Let's look at the SN2 first. So here we have OH- which will be our nucleophile, the hydroxide ion. And here we have our alkyl halide, iodomethane, that we're going to call our substrate. Okay, and our product here is the OH has substituted for the iodide and the iodide has left the molecule. So we're going to call our halogen here the leaving group, okay, LG. And this thing over here with the negative charge will be our nucleophile. And the mechanism for this is the nucleophile attacks our delta plus carbon and kicks off this iodide.
And here's the mechanism that they draw, a little nicer than I did. Okay, it's attacking the delta plus carbon. Okay, you get this temporary transition state where the OH is bonding and the iodide is leaving. That's why it's a dash line here. And then it fully attaches to give you the product and the iodine has fully left to be the leaving group. Okay, it's a bimolecular nucleophilic substitution reaction, meaning that bi two molecules are involved in the transition state. It's a concerted reaction, okay, meaning that everything is happening at once, okay, meaning that a new bond is forming between the OH and carbon at the same time that the old bond, this one here, is breaking. Okay? So it's a concerted reaction like a rock concert. Everything is happening at once. Also the reaction is overall second order, okay? Where these two here are involved in the rate law and they are raised to the first power as shown here. Here is the reaction coordinate diagram for the SN2 reaction. Okay, so note we start with our reactants here. We go through our transition state, which is this thing, and then our product forms. Okay, so note how it's been drawn. It's been drawn as a downhill favorable reaction. And again, remember our activation energy is the height of this hill. And because we only have one transition state, this is a one-step reaction. Here are some other examples of nucleophiles we could use to do substitution reactions. So all these are halogens of different types and I could bring in a different nucleophile to substitute for the halogen leaving group. Iodide coming in, OH minus coming in to form an alcohol, OR minus coming in to form an ether, SH minus coming in to form a thiol, and all these other things down here. Let's look at the nucleophile in the SN2 reaction. Okay. I also want to, before I do that, let's look at the symbolism of SN2. What does that mean? Okay. The S means that it's a substitution reaction. The N means we have used a nucleophile. And the 2 means it's bimolecular. Again, two molecules were involved in the transition state. So what's the effect of the nucleophile? Well, if I have a stronger nucleophile, it tends to make the reaction go faster, which makes sense. What are strong nucleophiles? They tend to be strong bases. Okay. But as we will see, not all strong nucleophiles are basic. Okay. So here's some examples of some strong nucleophiles. Look at these things here. Okay. Remember the key thing I need to be a nucleophile is I need a lone pair. And you can see each of these have a lone pair on them. Okay. When I get to these weaker nucleophiles, see how these things with no charges on them tend to be weak? Okay. And remember uh, the conjugate bases of strong acids tend to be weak. Let's look at the definition of basicity as compared to the definition of nucleophilicity. The definition of a base is something that grabs a proton from an acid. 
the definition of a nucleophile is what it attacks a carbon atom not a hydrogen okay so I should have more properly drawn this simply NU here where the B is acting as a nucleophile okay so when I have my base acting as a nucleophile it means it's attacking a carbon atom and kicking off a leaving group here Steric hindrance or bulkiness can hinder nucleophilicity more than it can hinder basicity. We'll see an example of that later. What are some trends in nucleophilicity? Okay, the first trend is that if you have a negatively charged nucleophile, it's always stronger than its neutral counterpart. So here, OH minus would be a much stronger nucleophile than water where I've added a proton. Same thing for these two. A second trend is nucleophilicity decreases when I go from left to right. Okay. Or here uh, what we're doing is looking at a group of atoms. Okay. So when I look at a group of atoms, the better nucleophile is always at the bottom of the group, such as iodine, or selenium compared to oxygen, or phosphorus compared to nitrogen. Okay, So nucleophilicity increases as we go down a group because the size and the polarizability increases. So what does it mean if something is polarizable? Let's look at these two nucleophiles here, F minus and I minus. Okay. I minus is a bigger size than F minus. We have a large valence shell and so we say we're dealing with a soft base. Whereas fluorine, F minus, has a small valence shell so it's closer to the nucleus and so those electrons tend to be attracted more and not as available and so as a result it's a what we call a hard base if we have a soft base if you look here it's able to extend its electron density out toward the carbon atom better than the fluorine does Okay, the fluorine doesn't want to give up its electrons very much. So the iodide can extend out in a greater space and so that what, that's what allows it to be a better nucleophile. Okay, it's softness like a marshmallow. It's able to squish its electron density over a greater distance. And we see that being stated here. Let's look at some solvent effects. Okay, What happens if we have a polar protic solvent such as an alcohol? Remember that we need a polar solvent because our reaction molecules are polar. But here if we have a polar solvent that's protic, that is a hydrogen on an oxygen atom, I can get hydrogen bonding occurring to the nucleophile and so form a solvent cage around it and so this attack is going to be very difficult isn't it? Okay. So when we use polar protic solvents it reduces the nucleophiles nucleophilicity so polar protic solvents are bad! Okay. If I were to use a larger nucleophile and going down a group, that would enable the nucleophile to be better uh, because of its polarizability effect. Let 
Instead we like to use polar aprotic solvents. Note that each of these, acetonitrile, DMF, and acetone, have no hydrogen on a polar or a, an electronegative atom. So these are very nice to use in SN2 reactions. Okay, So these things cannot hydrogen bond and so cannot form a solvent cage around the nucleophile. SN2 reactions love polar aprotic solvents. What about crowned ethers? What are these things? These are able to solvate the cation and so the nucleophilic strength of the anion increases. Here's an example. When we try to use a nucleophile that say is X minus, it never comes by itself. It always comes with a metal counterpart. So this metal in this case is potassium and the potassium positive charge is attracted to the negative charge. So if that's the case, it's hindering this thing from its nucleophilicity. So if I can take the potassium and get it away by using this crown ether where the oxygens solvate it, okay, then it allows this nucleophile to be bare and able to do its attack a lot better. This is called 18 crown 6. Why is that? Okay, it's crown, it's a crown ether, looks like a crown. 6 because I have 6 car or 6 oxygen atoms in the crown and 18 because the total number of atoms around the crown is 18. So if I start here with this oxygen, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 atoms, okay, making up the crown. So here, if our nucleophile was the fluoride ion, which came with potassium, and I used 18 crown 6, okay, I now speed up its nucleophilicity because the 18 crown 6 takes away the potassium and allows the fluorine to attack this carbon atom a lot easier. about leaving group ability? This is a very very important topic. The best leaving groups are electron withdrawing and they are stable. Okay, Here's a very important definition. Leaving groups are weak bases. Weak bases, that is not a strong base. And they tend to be polarizable. Here's some examples. Okay, here are some weak bases that are excellent leaving groups: the halogens, the sulfonate, the sulfate, the phosphate, found in ATP. Water, excellent leaving group. Alcohols, excellent leaving groups. Amines, excellent leaving groups. These are all weak bases. So if these things were attached to the carbon, I could do excellent substitution chemistry. Now let's talk about the substrate for SN2 reactions. The best substrates are the least substituted ones. So the methyl substrate would be the best. And then a primary alkyl halide and secondary a tertiary alkyl halide would be awful. The reason is because of stereokindrance. The tertiary substrate offers a lot of stereokindrance around the electrophilic carbon on the substrate. Here we see that as an example 
look at the reaction rates over here, the different substrates here, and they classify the substrates. So the methyl substrate goes very fast. Okay, here's a primary substrate. It's still fast, not as much as this one. Here's a secondary substrate. You can see it's a lot slower. And finally, a tertiary substrate, the T-butyl bromide, very, very much slower. So here they're demonstrating the steric effects on the substrate. The nucleophile approaches from the back side and it must overlap the back lobe of the carbon that's attached to the leaving group. So here we see it, some pictures of this. So here when OH- comes in, this is relatively easy attack. When I put two methyls on, uh, the attack becomes a little more difficult because again these CH3 groups are having some decent size so they're blocking the entry. And then when I get three CH3 groups now it's very very difficult for that OH- to do the backside attack. So that's why the tertiary substrate is the worst. How about stereochemistry of SN2 reactions? Well, when we look at this, when the nucleophile attacks and the leaving group is starting to leave, we get what's called a Walden inversion, where these three groups here invert to then point in the opposite way. And as a result of that inversion, if I started with an S chiral carbon here, after the reaction it inverts to the opposite, which would be R. And we call that a stereospecific reaction. Here they're demonstrating this, uh, showing the different orbitals. Okay, here maybe a better way to look at it with an umbrella kind of effect. So it's pointing this way and then it inverts this way here. Now let's talk about the SN1 reaction. Okay, This here is still a substitution reaction but it proceeds by a different mechanism. First of all, it's a unimolecular reaction. That's what the one stands for. Meaning what? There's only one molecule involved in the transition state. We're going to see it has a carbocation intermediate. Okay, The rate law is only dependent upon the concentration of the alkyl halide. Okay, and that's the thing involved in the major transition state. We'll also see that racemization occurs. That is, we get a mixture of stereoisomers as being the product. So, how does the mechanism occur? So, the first step is the leaving group leaves and so we form a carbocation and in the second step the nucleophile attacks the carbocation to give us our product. So the SN1 reaction is a two-step reaction. Remember the SN2 was a one-step. So this is not a concerted reaction like the SN2 was. And it's this step here that is the rate determining step that is the leaving group trying to leave. And so that's why it's a unimolecular reaction because this is the step that has the highest activation energy. Here's an example of the SN1. 
iodine leaves, I form the carbocation. Okay, and this step is the rate determining step. Step two, I'll use this alcohol here as the nucleophile. Note it's a weak base. Okay, SN1 likes to use weak bases. Make sure you have that down. SN2 likes to use strong bases as the nucleophile. So here the alcohol attacks. As a result, it's added on. Oxygen then has three bonds, and so it becomes positive. And it's going to make this hydrogen here acidic to want to leave. So if I bring in some base, it can attack this hydrogen so as to make the oxygen neutral. And that's what they show here. This is oftentimes called a deprotonation step where I take off a hydrogen. The energy diagram shows that we have two transition states. Again, the first one is the ionization of the substrate, okay, where the leaving group has left, and I have formed this carbocation. And the second step, the nucleophile attacks the carbocation and give us the final product. The intermediate here is this valley between the two transition states, and the intermediate is always defined as the carbocation. And the rate limiting or the rate determining step is always the first one, so it has the highest activation energy. The second step is always much faster. Okay, so we see that here. First step, it's endothermic, uphill. Second step is fast, small activation energy, and it's downhill, very favorable. The rates of SN1 reactions. Okay, the substrate, the best substrate this time is exactly opposite of the SN2. Here a tertiary substrate is the best because we get a more stable carbocation forming. Tertiary carbocations are much more stable than secondary and primary. Also, a better leaving group will increase the rate of the reaction. Polar protic solvents tend to be the best because they can solvate both ions that form. But in the end, whether you use a polar protic or polar aprotic, the reaction can occur. The structure of the carbocation Let's take a look at this one here. So here are the leaving group bromine leaves. The carbocation is simply a carbon with three bonds and an empty p orbital. So that the nucleophile could attack from the top or the bottom side of the p orbital. If it attacked from the top, as in this case, we get an S enantiomer. If it attacks from the bottom, we get the R enantiomer. And we end up getting a mixture of these. And so that's why the SN1 gave you a racemic mixture. Though in the racemic mixture, the uh, you did get a little bit of excess of the backside attack. Here, carbocation stability. Okay, we've covered this earlier. Tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary, than primary, than the methyl. The reason for that is hyperconjugation. Neighboring carbon hydrogen bonds can weakly overlap to help stabilize this empty p orbital. It can also be imbued by the inductive effect. If I have neighboring 
CH3s, those can donate electrons through the sigma bond to help stabilize this electron deficient carbon. Stereochemistry of the SN1. Okay, again, it can attack from the top or the bottom of the p orbital. Note that you get a little bit more of the inverted product as compared to the non inverted product. The reason for that is that in the SN1 reaction, the leaving group doesn't leave all at once, it leaves over time. And so at the beginning, all you're going to get is backside attack or the inverted product. And then finally when it leaves, then both sides are open for attack, such as are showing here. But initially, since you only got the inverted product, that's why you get a little bit more of it. We can also get rearrangement reactions. What's going on here? Well, let's suppose we have this secondary alkyl bromide. Okay. And if you look, we get two different products. One's called the not rearranged and the other is called the rearranged. Okay. And it has to do with carbocations rearranging to form a more stable carbocation. And there are two ways we can do that. One is called the hydride shift, where a hydrogen moves on an adjacent carbon. And the other is a methyl shift, where the, a methyl group moves on an adjacent carbon. Let's take a look at some examples. So here, if the bromine leaves, we form a carbocation here. They didn't show that. And then this methyl group can shift over to form a more stable tertiary carbocation. So initially this carbocation would have been primary, but after the shift it becomes tertiary, which is more stable. SN1 or SN2, how can we predict? Okay, here's a nice little chart that you might want to jot down. SN2 reactions like these substrates, they like to have strong nucleophiles. They use polar aprotic solvents. The rate law is bimolecular. There is inversion at a chiral carbon and you never see rearrangements. For the SN1, we only see these with tertiary and secondary substrates. Weak nucleophiles like to be used. You can also have the solvent be a nucleophile. In that case, you have what's called solvolysis. They tend to like polar protic solvents, but they can also use polar aprotic solvents. The rate law is unimolecular meaning I only have one molecule in the rate law. They like to undergo a type of racemization. Though remember, you get a little more of the inverted product. And if rearrangement is possible, they will give rearranged products. OK, so that ends our discussion of substitution reactions. Okay, if you want to take a break right now, hit the pause button because now we're going to move over to the next exam material which gets into elimination reactions. Okay, so let's go ahead and get to work. Remember in elimination reactions, a base takes a neighboring hydrogen to where the leaving group was. Okay? And this neighboring hydrogen on where the leaving group was is what's called a beta hydrogen. 
Okay. So in elimination reactions, the base always takes a beta hydrogen. Then those bonding electrons dump to form a full double bond or a pi bond to make a double bond. And then the leaving group, in this case bromine, leaves. You can have two types of elimination reactions, just like we had two types of substitution reactions. The E1, which typically uses a weak base, and the E2, which typically uses a strong base. And these are also called dehydrohalogenation reactions because I'm removing a hydrogen and a halogen. The E1 reaction, just like the SN1, is unimolecular. Two groups are lost, the hydrogen, that is the beta hydrogen, and the halogen. The nucleophile acts as a base, attacking the beta hydrogen. Okay, so E1 and SN1 reactions have same conditions, and so you'll typically end up with a mixture of products. Here's the E1 mechanism. Okay, just like in the SN1, the leaving group leaves, and so we get this carbocation intermediate. And then the second step, the base attacks the beta hydrogen to form the pi bond here. So we end up with a carbon-carbon double bond. Here's a closer look using molecular orbital chemistry. The base attacks the hydrogen. The sp3 electrons then overlap here to end up forming a pi bond. And the carbon changes from sp3 hybridization to sp2 hybridization. The reaction corner diagram, just like the SN1, is a two-step, where the first step is the rate determining step, has the highest activation energy. And again, the intermediate is this carbocation. The second step very fast and downhill. Here are different types of double bonds, carbon-carbon double bonds. What we do is we look at the carbons of the double bond and we ask how many alkyl groups are attached to it. Here I have a total of four, so I have a tetra-substituted double bond. Here I have three alkyl groups, so I have a tri-substituted. Here I have two alkyl groups, Note I could either have them like this or I could have had this CH3 on here so I could have two CH3s here. In either case you get a di substituted and if I just have one I have a mono substituted. Here's the key. The more substituted double bond is the more stable double bond. And this will help us when we deal with this very important rule called Zaitsev's rule. So what does Zaitsev's rule deal with? Okay. It says that if more than one elimination product is possible, the most substituted alkene is the major product. Okay. So you may want to write that down. It's in your book as well, but it never hurts to write this as many times as you can. And here we're going to use Zaitsev's rule. So here we're looking at what kind of elimination reaction. Well, I see the carbocation and a weak base. So this is what? An E1 reaction. And the base can attack either this beta hydrogen or this beta hydrogen. If it attacks this beta hydrogen, my double bond forms here. If it attacks this beta hydrogen, 
my double bond formed over here. Well, if it forms here, I get a tri-substituted double bond. If it forms over here, I get a di-substituted double bond. And we just learned that the more substituted that double bond is, the more stable it is. And so that tends to make this one form more. And so we call this the major product. The E1 can compete with the SN1. So again, you end up getting a mixture of products. Okay, carbocation can react with its own leaving group to return to reactant, or it could react with a nucleophile to give a substitution product, or it can lose a proton to form an elimination product, or it can rearrange to give a more stable carbocation and then react further. So this is a nice summary slide for E1 versus SN1 in terms of different things that can happen. What about the E2 reaction? Okay, The E2 reaction is bimolecular. That's what the 2 stands for. It requires a strong base just like the SN2. And as you could have predicted it's a one-step reaction. It's a concerted reaction where everything happens at once. Everything happens in one step. That is the double bond forms and the leaving group leaves and the beta hydrogen is attacked all in one step. Here's the mechanism for the E2. Base attacks beta hydrogen, pi bond forms, and leaving group leaves. They really should have an extra arrow here showing this is coming off at the same time. And here's the order of reactivity for alkyl halides because we want a more substituted double bond forming. When we talk about E2 stereochemistry, it gets a little complicated when we talk about this anti coparaplanar geometry. And here what we want is the beta hydrogen in the leaving group to be 180 from each other. The reason for that geometry is that the orbitals of the beta hydrogen and the halogen must be aligned so they can begin to overlap to form a pi bond in the transition state. Anticoplanar minimizes the steric hindrance between the base and the leaving group. Okay, So that's why we say it's anticoparaplanar geometry. Okay, Anti, so the leaving group and the base are opposite each other so the reaction can happen easier and paraplanar that is the hydrogen and the halogen are in the same plane so the p orbitals can overlap so that the pi bond can easily form. Here we see this anti coparaplanar geometry See how the hydrogen, the beta hydrogen, and the leaving group are anti to each other. Here it's shown nicely in this Newman projection. Down here, this is sin coparaplanar, where the beta hydrogen and the leaving group are on the same side. See how that creates repulsion because of the eclipsed interaction and so this way doesn't occur very easy. So that's why we always get the anti coparaplanar geometry. E1 versus E2. Okay. E1 
E1, tertiary substrates the best. We usually use a weak base, a good ionizing solvent, and the reaction rate only involves the substrate. It uses Zaitsev's rule. And we can get rearranged products. How about the E2? E2 works well with tertiary substrates. Okay, here we want a strong base. Solvent polarity not important because we're not ionizing anything. The rate law for the E2 depends on the substrate and the base. It likes to follow Zaitsev's rule. Coparaplanar geometry, anti. And there are no rearranged products. Okay, so this column over here is the E2 column, and this column here is the E1 column. So, what about comparing substitution reactions and or with elimination reactions? Okay, strength of the nucleophile determines the order. Strong nucleophiles or bases promote bimolecular reactions, that is the SN2 or the E2. Primary halides usually undergo SN2 reactions. Tertiary halides can give a mixture of SN1, E1, or E2, but they cannot undergo SN2. High temperature usually favors elimination. Bulky bases tend to favor elimination because bulky bases are terrible nucleophiles. Secondary alkyl halides, a little more challenging. We have strong nucleophiles, it'll promote SN2 or E2. If I have a weak nucleophile, it'll tend to promote SN1 or E1. Strong nucleophiles with limited basicity favor SN2. Okay, here's an example of uh, E2 versus SN2. And here's an example of E1 versus SN1. Okay, here they want to predict the mechanisms and products of the reaction. You can see it's a tertiary substrate. So I'm going to predict either what? The SN1 or E1. Here I have a weak base, so that lends that as well. Okay, so if I do the E1, I get these two possible products, with this one being major due to Zaitsev's rule, because that's a tertiary double bond, or a tri-substituted double bond. If I did the SN1 chemistry, then my alcohol would have attached here to finally end up with this ether product here. In this case, I have a secondary substrate, and I have a strong base. So the E2 reaction will command attention. So this strong base could take this secondary beta hydrogen to form a di-substituted double bond. If it took this hyd beta hydrogen here, I would get a mono-substituted double bond. So that's why in the elimination, that would be the major product. For the SN2 product, this would attack the carbon and kick off the bromine to give us this as our SN2 product.